Welcome to Mind Your Own Retirement, a podcast from Your Life Choices, Simplifying Retirement. I'm John Deeks, and this is the publisher, Kay Fallick, on the other side of the desk. Hello, Kay. Hello, John. <laughs> Trying to get as much vitamin D as I can in between the clouds. I'm a bit over winter now. You? I'm sick of winter. Sick but, of winter. But I remind myself it's fine to live in Melbourne where we have four seasons in a day Four and, and a year. In one day. Yeah, exactly. We certainly do, and uh, I hope that everyone's keeping well and looking after their their minds and their bodies across uh, the winter time because it is important. Except there are people sitting in Darwin who are sweltering in oh, blimey. 35 degrees. Can we come up and stay with you folks? Uh, yes. Or the, or the uh, of course, every time it gets cold in the south. The caravans go north. The snowbirds. Yeah, the yeah. snowbirds. Well, that's an American term because people go from, you know, upstate New York or Canada and they go to Florida and they call them the snowbirds. Are oh, coming. okay. Okay. And so we've got, of course, all those retirees and others who just, you know, travel north and enjoy the sunshine up north when it's cold and wet in the south. I know. And they put annoying pictures on <laughs> Facebook and <laughs> Instagram. I'm talking to you, Warren Wilson. Oh, dear. Hello, Warren. <laughs> well, um, we've had fantastic reaction to the podcast past, including our very important sex poll that we did. Episode six went over incredibly well, John, and we had a lot of people who went onto the website and read Cha Cha's story about Fantastic. her unexpected encounter. Wasn't she wonderful? She was fabulous. And it really is important, I think, for us to give a shout out to all the real people in the Your Life Choices community mm. to say talk to us. Absolutely. And if you'd like to know more, you can always go to the Your Life Choices website. It's uh, very simple. Just go to yourlifechoices.com.au and you'll find out more. And of course, all our past podcasts as well. They are there. What and do we have coming up uh, on today's episode? Well, the first thing is, where have I been and what have I done? Oh, so true. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking about that before, what? weren't we, before we came on what? here? <laughs> so the highlight of my past week or so was going to a show called Come From Away, a stage show showing at the Comedy Theatre in Melbourne. It's, it's a story behind 9-11. Okay. When 37 planes could not land in the United oh, yes. States. It's a true story. True story. So they went to Gander Airport in Newfoundland in Canada. So this is a traditional um, a airport. Staging point. For, correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. From really from the transatlantic mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. So that was where planes went to refuel and so on. And it's an, an emergency landing spot for transatlantic still. flights still. And 37 planes went into Gander and the township had about maybe 2,000 people who then catered for the crew and passengers of 37 planes. Open, open their houses and open their hearts. Uh, there, you got it. You got it. It was the best theatrical entertainment Is I've that seen. Right? I went with our editor, Janelle. We loved it. We loved it. So, is this an Australian production? Is it a no, Euro? No, no, no. It started in Canada. It's been on Broadway and it was nominated for seven Tonys. It's now in Melbourne, going to Sydney, hopefully other capital cities in Australia. But the big treat is we have Donna Campbell from Destination Canada in our travel segment. Oh, fantastic. To tell us about Newfoundland. Oh, that's great. So that'll be coming up a little bit later on. Yes. Uh, along with uh, some health and lifestyle issues, I guess. Of course. We're talking about financial security in retirement with the head of Challenges Retirement Division, Jeremy mm -hmm. Cooper, head honcho there. And the lovely Janelle will explain to us how to get a good night's sleep. Oh, fantastic. All coming Can't up wait. on this episode. <laughs> but don't fall asleep during our podcast. It's Mind Your Own Retirement from Your Life Choices, Simplifying Retirement. 
Mind Your Own Retirement is the podcast of your life choices, simplifying retirement. And uh, here, of course, with Kay Fallick, the publisher, me, John Deeks, and on the line, we're very important gentlemen. We have Jeremy Cooper, Chairman, Retirement Income at Challenger Limited. Just to set this up, Jeremy Cooper is Chairman of the Retirement Income at Challenger Limited, as mentioned, focusing on research, public policy issues, and thought leadership. And prior to joining Challenger, Jeremy chaired the Cooper Review... Now, I've always wanted a review named after myself, the Deeks uh, Review. I don't think the you're going to get there, No, John. I don't think so. No. I'm no, nowhere near as smart as this man. <laughs> uh, into superannuation system. Uh, Jeremy, welcome along to Mind Your Own Retirement. Good to be here, John. So, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, what we're talking about right now are the greatest money concerns in retirement. And by way of introduction, we're jointly releasing the results of the Ensuring Financial Security in Retirement Survey, a survey we ran on our website earlier this year, 3,700 responses to 40 questions about retirement savings, income and attitudes. And we're very taken by the, the main themes that have emerged from this report, but we're setting you up to answer the hard questions here. So without any further ado, it seems that most people are concerned about whether their their money will last. We know that careful and realistic financial planning is really key to making the most of your retirement income. But given that more than half Australians enter retirement for reasons of of health issues or difficulty continuing work, what happens if if you're suddenly retired? Well, I I guess there are two main things that are helping you. The first is the age pension. So even though you might uh, unexpectedly enter retirement, the age pension, if you're uh, age eligible, that is. Uh, So currently, Australians have to be... uh, at least 66 years old now to be eligible for the age pension. So that's potentially there to help you. But in particular, there's your super. And it's a pretty good story now that our our system is some 27 years old. What we're seeing is that the typical case for going into retirement is is what we call a a couple household. So around about 70% of Australians start retirement as some form of financial couple. Typically, it's a married couple, but it doesn't always have to be. And zoning in on those people who are just on the the eve of retirement in in that age group, we're finding that the the typical household in in that age bracket has got around about $400,000 in super. Now, at that level, you're you're still going to be assisted by the age. You're in that zone of the sort of part, part age pension zone, if you like. So you, you'd be uh, pulling down the part age pension according to your income and asset entitlements, but topping up so that you're leading some kind of reasonable lifestyle by drawing down your super at a, a steady pace, one assumes? Yeah. So interestingly, we've just done some research looking at um, not so much all retirees, but people in that just retired bracket. So what we did was we picked people who were 66 at the end of 2018, and we said right at that moment, how many people are accessing the age pension? And we found that for 66-year-olds, the majority were getting no age pension at all, and that um, 45% of that age group were getting some age pension, um, 25% were getting a full, and 20% a part. So that's pretty um, new evidence, I suppose, of the success. Now, some of those people were, would, some of 66 year olds would still be working, but, but not many. We think around the 15% mark. But what it's showing is that super is really starting to work. So, okay, so we've got uh, some kind of good news story coming coming through there. Do you mind, um, I know one of the conclusions of the report was around stable spending. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, that's counterintuitive to some retirees who are, are very frugal and want to leave an inheritance and, and worry a lot about not having enough. How do you kind of work out what your stable spending amount should be? Anecdotally and from uh, survey evidence, 
it, it doesn't happen overnight. So the adjustment from being in the workforce and maybe paying for travel to and from work and work clothes and having to buy more expensive lunches than you might otherwise do, going from that environment into, into retirement does, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different lifestyle and so there is some adjusting to do. What regular spending is telling us is that people have actually worked out that really your super's deferred wages. It's money that you could have spent while you were working, but it's really there for actual spending in retirement. It's not like other capital that you can't spend. It's actually intended to smooth out your consumption so that you can enjoy pretty much the same sort of lifestyle by you know measured in terms of how much you're you're spending on a regular basis so that you can uh, maintain that lifestyle in retirement. So to think that people who are spending regularly are also uh, feeling more comfortable about retirement, um, you know, that, that checks out for me. Something that Kay mentioned was uh, people wanted to keep in money for inheritance. Uh, it, it seems over the last couple of years, the uh, spending the kids' inheritance has become quite uh, the thing and it's, uh, it's not a dirty word anymore. Are people spending their money more, winding it down so they don't necessarily leave money for the kids but in fact have a good time while they're alive? That, that seems to be the trend. What researchers tend to do is they ask people about their intentions, and and so most of the evidence is, you know, do you intend, you know, do you intend to spend most of your savings or leave them for the kids and so on? Divides into two things: the family home and other money are treated differently. People tend to have slightly different preferences regarding the home as they do other assets. But but what we're seeing is, and this this is because of the longevity effect, where you've almost got two generations in retirement. If you think about people who are in their 90s, for example, their inverted commas kids are uh, probably in their 60s and about to retire themselves. Yeah. And so this whole idea about being all hung up about uh, leaving money to the next generation. Um, and the other thing I, I'll mention here is all of the people um, going into retirement or in retirement now know their kids have got super. It didn't used to be the case. You know. So the, the landscape has changed dramatically. And, and moving on with the theme of changes, what also came out of that survey, Jeremy, was the frustration of retirees with what they say are constant changes to the rules. Yeah. Um, yeah. They they seem to find it a challenge. Now it may not be actual and changes. Frightening, frightening. It's, yeah. Frightening. Uh, a, a lack of control. So it might be mooted changes that don't go through. But how how would you say to an an ordinary Australian retiree to to manage the the way they um, deal with this concern? Okay, this is a very obvious response, but clearly they need to be subscribers to your life choices. So <laughs> that and, money worked well. Find, yep, <laughs> find the information on your useful website. But look, I sympathise with them. Uh, I think there are too many changes done done too quickly. I think everybody feels a bit of this. And of course, if you are approaching retirement or in retirement, you've got less options available to you. You know, while you're working, you can decide you're going to work longer or make other changes. When you're in retirement, you, you do have less flexibility. Jeremy, if uh, people want to know more, I take a K that uh, Jeremy has got some information well, uh, joined up with you folks. We're releasing this on our website, but okay. also on challenger.com.au. Um, the, the report will be there, but they've also got a very helpful ebook about planning retirement. Excellent. Uh, Jeremy, one last question. When are you going to retire? <laughs> uh, it'll be some way off yet, John. <laughs> Good uh, on you, mate. <laughs> yeah, I intend to keep working well into my 70s. Yeah, that's the spirit. Yeah, I'm with you, fella. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your time today, Jeremy. We do appreciate it. My pleasure. Welcome back. It's Mind Your Own Retirement, the podcast from Your Life Choices. And uh, let's head over to the head of Destination Canada in Australia, Donna Campbell's on the line. Hi, Donna. Hi, how are you? We find you at an airport where? You find me at an airport in Melbourne heading back up to Sydney. 
Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much for giving up your time. And, of course, uh, the lovely Kay Fallock is here and uh, we've got some uh, questions about a wonderful play she's just been to see. So here we go, Donna, and what nobody else knows but you and I know is we've been friends since 2002 and you have continually inspired me to travel to Canada and were very instrumental in making sure I got to Newfoundland. So... I've introduced the topic of Newfoundland um, uh, and Labrador, I should be saying, but I'll let you talk to that, uh, through Come From Away, which is obviously a fantastic new show. So do you want to tell us why would Your Life Choices members want to visit Newfoundland? Well, okay, I'm so glad I've been able to entice you to be coming to Newfoundland and, and Labrador. And um, look, some of the key reasons are, are very evident in, in the, the play Come From Away, which is a really interesting and very, very heartfelt performance. But the, the, the key reasons are there's so much to see and do in Newfoundland. It is the easternmost point in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so it sort of gives you a, a place of perspective as to where, where Newfoundland is. So it is exactly as far east in Canada as you can go. And there's so much to see and do when you get there. Everything from the bird life to the wildlife to going out to see whales to seeing the puffins. There's lots of outpost little villages as well all around Newfoundland. So ocean cruising in and around Newfoundland and Labrador is a phenomenal thing to do. The history is absolutely evident everywhere you look in Newfoundland. We've got the what I think is the oldest Viking settlement. It's over a thousand years old in Lanso Meadows. So you've got the, the National Historic Site with the sod buildings. We've got some beautiful scenery with Grossmore National Park and the fjords that you can um, go up and down. There's just so much to see and do. And the one thing that I got to do on this last trip when I was in Newfoundland was we went out of Twillingate and we went and saw the icebergs. And the icebergs are coming down and they're flowing down the eastern seaboard and they actually come aground almost at Twillingate and then they will either melt and they will continue on down past um, St. John's, which is the capital of Newfoundland. But to be able to go out into the ocean and to see these monstrosities of ice that are just sometimes sitting perched, anchored um, on the shore or just floating on by, it's one of those heart-stopping moments that you will forever remember in your mind. Um, yeah, so, so Donna, tons to do. a hundred things to do. The, the people, when I was there, um, made a huge impression on me, and I think it's probably the Celtic background, but these are, are sort of backs-to-the-wall kind of people who tend to be snowed in or iced in for long periods, and they're very community-minded. You're 100% right. As I said earlier, it's the outposts or it's the bad weather that have precluded people from, you know, moving around and, and getting, you know, into in and around and traveling around Newfoundland in general in the old days. And so what you stand up happening is is that people, you know, you rely on your neighbor. You had to you had to be there to to, to support one another in that community environment. And that has never been lost in Newfoundland. The people are so generous and so kind and so hospitable. They give you the shirt off their back. If you look hungry, they'll feed you. As, um, as is the case with uh, Come From Away, the uh, the the play which uh, Kay was alluding to earlier in this podcast, where uh, all those aircraft that were grounded after the uh, Twin Tower attack uh, that were the grounded and went to Taganda, and um, all those good folks just looked after them so well. They did, and the, and the play portrays that. Beautifully, where some of the you know the, the the main twelve characters, you know, a lot of them didn't sleep for four days. They just rallied together. Can you imagine? All of a sudden, you've got seven thousand people coming for dinner. What do you do? Mm. They actually figured it out. They went into their homes and they cooked meals and casseroles and they brought them out and had food ready for when the pl- people got off the plane. Anywhere sort of eighteen to twenty hours after they had all landed. And not only did they feed them, they housed them, they entertained them, they took them for walks, they they introduced them to their life to the point that you had people who were shattered and not knowing what was going on in life and what was going on in the world, four days later, didn't actually want to leave because they were so 
engaged and involved with the Newfoundland people. That um, And that thread has actually carried on um, years and years later, where people now go back to Newfoundland to, to take visitors and family members to, to show them what it was like when they were there and, and what the Newfoundland people are really like. And in general, it's, it's how Canadians are, um, very heartwarming. But in Newfoundland, they just take it that one step further. And, our, and Australians are so used to um, visiting Canada. We, we love Canada. But uh, Newfoundland is, a, is so far away from where we would normally travel along uh, the, the BC area and uh, moving right across there. How do you actually get there? <laughs> well, yeah, it's not that far. But you actually, you'll land in Vancouver and then you'll fly across to, to Toronto or Montreal um, one of the cap cities sort of in the in the mid eastern section of Canada and then you take one further flight to go on into into um, into Newfoundland. You'd be landing in St. John's, Newfoundland. So Donna, my main tip is that I think people should consider self drive because I think you can get so much out of you know, we we are talking some distances around Newfoundland. But also can you tell us um just before we wrap up when you think the best time to go is? Because they, are, um, they have all different seasons of weather, sometimes in one day, the best time to be in, in, in Newfoundland is really from May to October. Right. The icebergs are coming down May and June. We got lucky in July and saw them, um, and that's not always the case. So sort of that May-June period, you're guaranteed to see the wildlife out in the ocean, you're guaranteed to see the icebergs coming down. And then, of course, driving, as you say, Kay, is the best way to get around because from city to city or from little township to little township, um, it can be quite a distance and there isn't public transport. The main tip, I think, is for all our members now to hit the website and look for the deals right now to be thinking about going next year. I would totally endorse everything you've said. I think Newfoundland has to be the hottest destination. It certainly is, and you need to have an iceberg beer when you get there, Kay. Or an I did. I did. <laughs> I bet you did too. <laughs> Head of Destination Canada in Australia. Take care, Donna, and we'll see you in Newfoundland, and uh, thank you so much for giving up your time. My absolute pleasure. You've got a lot of living to do in retirement. Are you confident you can pay for it? A Challenger Lifetime Annuity can complement your super and the age pension, giving you guaranteed income for life, regardless of how the share markets perform or how long you live. So like thousands of other retirees, you too can look forward with confidence. Find out more at challenger.com.au. Before investing, consider whether a Challenger Annuity is appropriate for you. Read the PDS from Challenger at challenger.com.au. Welcome back. Janelle's on the line. Hello, Janelle. Hello, John. How are you? Oh, look. Oh, I had a I had a really good night's sleep last oh, night. Do you know oh, why? Because I didn't have a glass of wine. Yes, that's that's part of that's part of the. Because every time I have a glass of uh, red wine, well, actually, when I have about two, yes, I wake yes. up at uh, three o'clock in the morning and I'm yes. ready to, you know, like doing have another uh, one. Yeah, so you've just ticked a lot of boxes for how not to get a good night's sleep. And and the other thing is, I try not to go on my iPad or my iPhone before I go to sleep. Mm. Sorry, you know, my, you know it all. And I, I'll shut up now. Is this the, the end of the episode? The, the, the <laughs> boss, the boss is looking at me like, "Hey, son, oh, that, well, they're all my questions, you idiot." Well, I'm just going to, you know, go away now because no. you know Ooh. it all. No, don't, don't, Ooh. don't. No, don't get sad. <laughs> okay. How's your, have you got a nice bed? I, I have a lovely bed. Yeah. Do you know I what? Know I know you meant to change your bed every five years, but oh, when you've got a really good one, who wants to do that? It's like a husband, isn't it? Really. <laughs> Um, or partner. Ooh, so, ooh. Uh, <laughs> what, or she's zipping her mouth now. But uh, when I grew up, I don't know about UK, but uh, back in the uh, the 30s, um, when I grew up, the beds were horrible, yeah. just horrible. Do you remember My pa- the mattresses? Oh, well, you know. Those old Hessian ho- sort of. Horse hair kind horse of things. Horse hair, things. yes. And, and, and you had this big sort of, uh, sort of bow underneath and, yep. and your backs and everything else. And I was always yep. determined yep. that uh, when I was old and rich, I was going to get a really good bed. But I'm sort of old and not so rich, but I've got a really good bed. And a pillow, a Thank good you. pillow. So I remember sleeping in the same room as my brother, which was before things got politically correct, and my mother would come in at night. I'm sorry, what was that? Hot summer's <laughs> night. And Betty would come in with the old tin can of 
I'm going to say kerosene or something okay. to repel mosquitoes. Oh, okay. And she would pump the contents of that entire can in the room, shut the door. Oh, you can't oh. beat a bit of good old DDT in the room before well, you go to sleep, can I you? I think she was trying to kill us, but yeah. apparently she was trying to save us from malaria. Oh. oh what to, have, we, had we heard of a mosquito net, which is what I used to sleep under in central Queensland? You're from the country, mm. my friend, mm. and Carol. I'm a city mm. chick. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So tell us some of uh, Janelle Ward's tips on getting a great night's sleep. Well, okay, first of all, let me tell you about the poll because our poll found you're meant to get, as you get older, you don't need less sleep. So you still need seven to eight hours per night, most nights. Now, in our poll, 40% of our members said they only got five to six hours, mm. and that's bad because... <sighs> You continuously do that, and then it has mental and physical health um, um, problems. So, yeah. Why were they not getting the useful hours? Well, most of them were worried about certain things like money, money and health and, and, and not tuning out, I guess not following the protocols for getting a good night's sleep. Um, oh, so we've got the bad news, Janelle. Yeah. Well, Let's go good here. Let's... Well, and, and f- just further bad news is that oh. the federal government, they had a sleep inquiry. They spent millions on a sleep inquiry and found out that poor sleep was costing the economy $26.2 billion a year. Can you believe that? So, okay, but that's that's it. That's it with the bad news. I, I know that when I work on uh, Australia Overnight for the Macquarie Network, uh, which um, the boss across from me, Kay Fellick, has been a uh, guest on, mm. uh, we get a lot of folks who do wake up early in the morning and yeah. do tune into the radio, um, hear my voice and go straight back to sleep. <laughs> uh, but a, 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 a lot of could, elderly folk Could we uh, do, do that for our members? Oh, could yeah. you sing a lullaby and we could put it online? Your life choices. <laughs> la, 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 la. Instead of counting sheep, we yeah. just listen to Dexter. So some good news. The good news. So the things that you can do to get a good night's sleep, would that, would that be good news? Yeah, of course. Okay. So wind down gently. Have a set pattern before going to bed. Don't over imbibe. I mean, a, a glass of red wine or white wine would be fine, but, you know, call it quits at the one. You steer clear of the blue screen. So, you know, all our devices, iPads, mobile phones, just leave them out of the bedroom. And even turn, if you, like most people, I guess, and have that um, that uh, wake-up clock next to your bed, you turn it around so you can't see. There's nothing worse than waking up a couple of times during the night and you check the clock and you think, oh, my God, it's only 3 o'clock. What do I do? So turn that around. Don't look at the clock. Um keep your bedroom nice and dark and quiet, windows down. Um, They're all the things you should do. So is a blue screen a TV also? Yes, yeah. I mean, who who has TVs in their bedroom these days? Not me. Too many many people, though, I think, do. do. It's, um, yeah, shameful. And I guess also, uh, speaking uh, personally, uh, not trying to drink too much fluid before going to bed because... uh, um, uh, you obviously, have to get up. well, you've got to get up, go wee wee's, mm. you know, about mm. three or four times. It's yeah. it's going to break that pattern. So yeah. stay off you, fluids. Well, that's right. It's it's being thoughtful, isn't it? Before you know, leading up to bedtime, it's don't have your bit. You know, don't have your main meal, a, a heavy main meal, too late. Don't drink too much fluid or or wine. There's a lot of don'ts if you want to think about it and get a good night's sleep. So mm. be thoughtful. So Janelle, my way of going to sleep, which is since I was a kid, um, I read. And I normally read fiction, normally, but don't have to. But if you told me I wasn't allowed to read something before I went to sleep, I'd be devastated. But so, do you mean do you mean read on an iPad or? Oh or no do you no, mean I don't I don't read on an iPad. Yeah, um, book, I read book. I read a printed book, yes, and that wonderful. Well, it shifts my headspace from my day, mm. whatever might be in my monkey mind, mm. and it puts other ideas or thoughts mm. or whatever in there. Is that listed as a good thing to oh, do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, that would be part of your pattern of. Mm. Of you know getting to that point, it's it's what allows your mind to stop, as you say, monkey mind. Just stop mm. thinking about 
your to-do lists and the things you've got to do tomorrow and, and your worries and whatever. You focus on the book and you're distracted and you get tired and hopefully you fall asleep for a good length of time. And make sure you've got a, a good bed. Exactly. Now, yeah. I, I'm a bit of a fan of the, of the Nana Nap. Yeah. Is, is that a good thing about Because I find, for me, as long I never sort of go into REM, so I, I can only have, I have about 45 minutes, mm. and I, I'm just ready to fire on all cylinders. I'm jumping around like a, like a Mexican jumping bean <laughs> after that. Um, we, we ran an article uh, a little while ago, and we had four experts who said, are naps good? You know, we asked them the question, are naps good or bad? Three out of the four said, Naps are fine, but don't nap for too long. That's the secret. You know, 15 to 20, 25 minutes is fine. So if you're one of those people that need to nap but are likely to overstay your welcome in that regard, you need to set the alarm because if you sleep for, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, you're probably going to um, wake up at 3 o'clock and Mm. wonder what the hell you're going to do with yourself, which is mm, not pleasant. Janelle, I, I take it that uh, your tips on how to get a good night's sleep are on the yourlifechoices.com.au website? It absolutely are. Okay. Under health and lifestyle? It would be under health, exactly. Yeah, All right. Sleep, well, th- 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 thank you for giving up your time today. I hope we didn't oh, wake you. Oh, pleasure. I, exactly. <laughs> I, will, I will go put my head down now. Go have your nana nap, Janelle. You've <laughs> thank earned you. It. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. And as we always like to do, we have a a nugget of inspiration, a nugget, a a gold nugget from Kay Fallock to give us before we depart. So this week I was thinking what makes a blockbuster, because I was told Come From Away is a blockbuster. Mm -hmm. And I looked it up and I thought, well, it's a big Hollywood movie, which now is how we use it. But it used to be a huge bomb that actually took out an entire city block during the Second World War. Mm. Not a great start. But then out came the movie Jaws, Steven Spielberg, 1975. It was uh, first screened in summer and the crowd actually queued around the block. So they said, Oh, really? Here's a blockbuster. Wow. So we've learned something, John. We certainly have, Kay. Do you feel better? I do, I do. (laughs) And I want to go and see that wonderful play you went and saw. Come From Away. I hope it's still going. Oh, well, I think it will be. I think it's got a long run in Melbourne. Then it goes to Sydney and hopefully other capital cities at least. Yep. As always, it's been a pleasure to be with you on this uh, podcast, Kay Fallick. Too much fun. Too much fun. And if you'd like to know more uh, about your own retirement and so much more, the things we've spoken about today and perhaps things that have uh, gone in the past, all our podcasts and so much more is available on the website yourlifechoices.com.au. We'll see you next time on Mind Your Own Retirement.